Okay, so uh, in the last few days, you've been introduced to the Cobra WAF pipeline of, of analysis, and you were introduced mainly by the beautiful talk by Robin Goodson yesterday. And what I'd like to do in this talk is to introduce you to an application of this Cobra WAP pipeline of analysis and to point out how it has been crucial for us to have such an automatic tool to get to the results for this specific work. Here we aim at uh, inferring from experimental data the parameters of a mean field simulations capable to reproduce the spontaneous activity observed in um, anesthetized anesthetize mice. So just a little recap, you're gonna see more about this later today in the hands-on session also by Robin. Uh, Cobra Wap pipeline of analysis is a, a tool that is compliant with the FAIR principles. The idea is that this tool of analysis might be able, is able to get in input different kinds of data sets and to uh, process them, analyze them, uh, building and combining different blocks according to uh, the uh, kind of data set you're analyzing and to give you a quantitative out output. So we aim at quantitatively analyze data, quanti quantitatively characterize them in order to be able to compare different kind of data sets and specifically for this work to compare uh, experimental data set to simulated ones. Okay, so what's the take home uh, message from this talk? Um, again, we aim at propose an inference method to infer the optimal parameters of a mean field model of the activity of the whole hemisphere of mouse under ketamine anesthesia. The data set we applied this method was provided by Lens uh, from Florence and is acquired through white field calcium imaging uh, methods and it records the cortical activity of the right hemisphere of mouse under ketamine anesthesia. Uh, the strength, one of the strengths of these techniques are its high spatial resolution that allows us to um, identify and uh, characterize uh, different patterns of propagation dynamics in the uh, observed slope waves activity. Uh, in this work, we present two-step inference method. Uh, this is articulated into first an inner loop, that is one flow of information from experimental data set to a simulated data set um, to optimize the inner parameter of the mean field network. And then uh, we need an outer loop, so an a posteriori um, calibration of the external parameters of this mean field model in order to, gain, to, to be able to reproduce all the variety we observed in experimental data set. Again, we can rely on, the, uh, on an incredibly high spatial resolution that leads us, gives us the possibility to observe quite a variety in this spontaneous <coughs> activity and we want to be able to reproduce all this variety through our method. Finally, we also need an a posteriori model validation. We are using some features from the experimental data set in order to fit our model, but we also want to be sure that we are not just overfitting those, um, those observables, but we are actually capable to reproduce the spatial temporal dynamics of waves. Okay, so um, I'm gonna start from the end. <laughs> uh, this is our results. Um, I'd like to convince you that this method is actually working. You have data on your right and simulation on your left. So uh, just have a look at data set, uh, so experimental data on your right. Uh, you can see here different kinds of waves displayed in this movie. Uh, we have uh, circular waves, spiral, spiral waves. We have a predominance of planar like diagonal waves, but also other features are displayed. And again, we can observe this thanks to the high spatial resolution. Um, in mean field simulation, we are capable to reproduce all uh, these aspects. We are able to reproduce the variety of observed waves in experimental data. Um, we are happy about this, but the problem is that all these considerations are quite qualitatively. Uh, we are not happy about this. Uh, about this uh, in science, we want some quantitative measure. How do we characterize the observed activity in experimental waves? How we compare the, simulated, uh, the simulation dynamics with the observed one in a quantitative way? Is there a measurement that allows us to define how good our simulation, our model, is reproducing the experimental data sets? And this is what we'd like to point out in this talk. Um, okay, so this is just a recap slide. I'm not going again into this um, 
uh, characteristics. The point that I would like to stress out here is that we are not aiming at performing an exact uh, copy of the experimental data set. That would be quite easy. We want to build a mean field model that is capable to spontaneously reproduce all the variety observed in the experimental data set. Um, okay, so let's start from the experiment. Um, again, this is a wide field calcium imaging data set uh, recorded on uh, the right hemisphere of mouse under ketamine anesthesia that has been provided by Lens. And here's uh, some uh, of the observ observables we have decided to study. Okay, so first of all, let's focus on uh, panels A, B, and C that are the ones here. Uh, we applied this method on two mice, uh, top line and bottom line, but from, for this presentation, I'm only showing the second mice here. If you're interested, we can discuss later, or uh, you can have a look at the archive paper we, <laughs> we have just um, uploaded. Okay, so here's some quantitative measurements of the uh, local um, characteristics of uh, slow waves activity. We uh, measure local velocity, direction, and interwave interval uh, of the observed and detected waves. And again, we are able to do that automatically through the pipeline of analysis. Um, thanks to these cumulative observables, you can have an idea of how uh, the features of the observed waves are actually uh, distributing and how they are characterized so we can identify mean velocity or uh, the predominant direction, but still this is a cumulative quantity. These quantities are the ones we used in, the now, in an outer loop. So uh, in our inference procedure, we are actually fitting these uh, macroscopic cumulative local uh, observables for waves. Then we also asked if we were able to characterize the wa slow waves dynamics and spatial temporal patterns. And to do so, we applied a clustering procedure. And specifically, we decided to apply the uh, Gaussian mixer models. The idea here is to work in the channel space, so quite a high dimensional space. Uh, we are working with a dimension of about 2,500 channels, so it's quite huge. And we try to uh, describe all the detected waves as overlapping combination of Gaussians, in, of multivariate Gaussians in this space. So uh, the idea is that thanks to this method, we can clusterize our waves, give a probability of each wave to belong to each of the identified clusters. The number of clusters is automatically detected, and this is uh, the typical uh, waves we can identify in our uh, experimental data set. Uh, so we have differences in direction, and in velocities, you can see from sc different scales here, and um, okay, different uh, probably different function of waves belonging to each of these clusters. Um, so in the end, through the pipeline, we were able to characterize the uh, experimental data. Set. Now we need to use the da this data set to identify the optimal parameters in order to be able to um, be to, to reproduce the activity through a mean field simulation. So as I told you, we uh, propose two step inference method. First, we have an inner loop. This is a standard, let's say, let's say, likelihood maximization procedure. We have one flow, one way flow of information from data to model. And here we infer all the internal parameters of our generative model that is made, uh, that is a network of ADEX neurons. Um, and this actually works. In the end, we are actually capable to reproduce the main feature of the main mode of experimental data set. So um, this is not something, something we could stop here. The problem is that thanks to the high spatial resolution of the data set we are working on, uh, we, we are not satisfied with just getting the uh, main mode, the average behavior. We also want to be able to reproduce all the variety in the dynamics. And that's why we need another loop to fit the external parameter. We stimulate our simulated network through an external uh, import current, and we modulate that current um, in a periodic way. So in the outer loop, we fit the amplitude and period of this external current modulation uh, to actually be able to reproduce the main features uh, observed in the experimental data set. And here's an example. So thanks to the pipeline, we can uh, define a quantitative measurement of how well 
our simulation is reproducing the experimental data set, and we decided to rely on the uh, Earth mover distance over the histograms displaying the distribution of wave velocities, direction, and interwave intervals. Here you can get an example of a, a good set of parameters where the simulation in red is quite uh, well uh, reproducing what is observed in experiment, and a bad example of simulation here where uh, the uh, red uh, curve uh, displaying the simulation outputs is not really fitting the uh, experiment. And again, this is done automatically. You can see here that having to, to, to make a grid search over the parameters, and here we took into consideration two, but in principle we might took into consideration higher number of uh, changing parameters. It's crucial to have an automatic way, a mm, combinable way that is capable to detect the optimal points for our uh, simulations versus experiment. Um, here's to convince what we are doing. Here you can see the rastrogram of the activity channels versus time. I believe most of you are familiar with this kind of plot, but let's say each point <coughs> in this plot is uh, the detection of a transition from down to up state for a set channels at a certain time. <coughs> so vertical lines here display trolling waves. Here we have the experimental data set. You can see that there's such a variety in how many channels are involved in th into the traveling waves and uh, how um, wide are these vertical lines, meaning how uh, slow or fast is the observed wave and so on. We clusterize these waves into four different modes. You can see here that we have a predominance of the first mode, the blue one, but also some yellow and purple uh, modes are displayed here. Then we have the output of the, out of the inner loop. As you can see here, we are actually capable to display after the first step of inference procedure um, quite well the main mode, the blue one, of the experimental data. But this is quite stereotyped. We want more variety. And to do so, we need the outer loop. In the output of the outer loop, we get that variety. We have, again, uh, waves uh, involving different numbers of channels, and we are capable to identify, again, not only blue modes, but also yellow and purple ones. OK, this is just a sum up uh, slide. I don't think I have much time to do that, so I'm skipping it. But again, the idea is that we want it to be automatic. We want to be extendable to higher uh, dimension of the fitting uh, parameters. Um, OK, so we're happy about that. Uh, we fit our parameters. We got the optimal ones. Uh, we perform a mean field simulation simulation, but then we wanted to be sure that we were not overfitting our uh, parameters taken into consideration in the outer loop and just um, getting an overfit simulation and not be able to display the whole spatial temporal dynamics of waves. Actually, till now, we have only taken into consideration like cumulative distribution of um, macroscopic observables. So again, we relied on the Gaussian mixer models. We um, asked to uh, identify the main modes for uh, only the simulated data set, and these are the three modes identified. And we also ask to um, identify the main modes, so the main clusters of experimental plus simulated data sets. And here you can see that um, uh, the simulation is actually reproducing quite well the experiment with the only exception of a fourth mode, the pink one, that actually has, uh, is quite slow, uh, is quite a slow traveling wave. So this can also gives, uh, give us an hint on how to uh, better refine our simulation and how to um, work towards a always better uh, simulated mo models. This is a strength of this uh, method, uh, the validation part. It's quite hard to, to be able to validate our model. It's quite hard to, to be able to automatically, to, to get a method to automatically um, identify in a quantitative way how well we are performing. And here's what is our proposal. OK, so um, I guess I have five more minutes or so. Uh, so just really briefly, again, uh, I'm going to end at the beginning. Um, what I'd, li I'd like to, to, to make clear is that we needed the Cobra Wap pipeline. Uh, everything we'd done, we could have made like in a custom uh, Python script. But thanks to the Cobra Wap pipeline, uh, this model is reproducible, is generali generalizable, uh, might be applied to different kinds of data sets. And it can be applied in the exact same way. We don't really need to, to change lots of things. Thanks to the um, 
blocks and not puzzle pieces uh, Robin was talking yesterday. Um, again, uh, to do so, we need to define quantitative measurements um, to rely on. And specifically, we decided to use the uh, earth mover distance to compare data and simulations. OK, so this is what we've done. We are quite happy of our work. Um, we believe, yeah, <laughs> we believe it, might, it, it obviously can be improved, but this is a concept idea and it might be nice to apply to, uh, to different data sets. Uh, it was crucial to have a high spatial resolution data set to deal with. And what we'd like to do next is to implement spiking simulation of this data set. So starting from the mean field, um, from the mean field model, we'd like to, um, to simulate each part, each pixel of the um, experimental data set reproduced mm -hmm. in the mean field model as um, an activity of spiking neurons. And uh, I believe there's a talk this afternoon uh, talking exactly about this and how and which are difficulties in doing such a work. And um, obviously, we are also working towards uh, a simulation of what happens when the um, data set is not only spontaneous activity of mouse under anesthesia, but also what happens when we uh, provide a stimulus to touch a mouse. And again, we are also working on that. OK, so thanks very much. That's all. <laughs>